Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, Salva and Zuba, for the uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Chris Jurgens. I'm the head of the Global Partnerships team uh, at the United States Agency for International Development. And it's a real pleasure to be here at uh, this event today. Um, and I just want to start by saying how pleased uh, USAID is to be a long-standing partner of uh, BCTA since the, uh, since the early days. Um, it's fantastic to see the growth of the network, the new commitments, the diversification of the types of companies and organizations that are uh, engaging in inclusive uh, business. And I think the panel will be a great representation uh, of that today, the increasing diverse range of organizations uh, innovating around inclusive business models. Um, let me first just take a moment and, and uh, say a few words around why this issue is important to USAID. Um, I lead the Global Partnerships team at USA. We're the sort of center of excellence for partnering with uh, the private sector um, through the Global Development Alliance that we manage. USAID's built uh, over 1,600 partnerships with 3,000 different partner organizations, uh, leveraging $19 billion in combined public and, and private uh, resources. Um, we're increasingly moving these towards the shared value sorts of partnerships with corporations that are focused on inclusive business and sourcing and alignment to core business. Um, and while we're very proud of this uh, track record of partnering, we've also uh, innovated uh, new ways of engaging with the private sector uh, as an agency. Um, so the, uh, last year's new alliance for food security and nutrition um, uh, around African uh, agriculture, um, our development innovation ventures uh, initiative as a platform for enabling uh, USAID to invest in social enterprises and other entrepreneurial uh, models to help them scale. Um, but we recognize there's much more we can do, and it's uh, a top priority for, for USAID across what we do. Uh, it's central to what uh, Administrator Raj Shah describes as uh, the new model of development um, that the agency is headed towards, and I think that this audience uh, is already resonating with. And this is a new model which recognizes that we as an agency need to partner with much more than our traditional uh, development partners to be proactive in engaging with business, with corporations, with uh, emerging market companies, with social enterprises, uh, with students, with social entrepreneurs, with universities and think tanks. Uh, it's a model in which um, we shift our way of thinking as an agency from an implementer of development programs to a catalyst of broad-based partnerships, bringing together diverse stakeholders with different resources and different expertise to solve uh, problems that no one sector can solve alone. And viewing all of this through the, the lens of sustainability, uh, of, of viewing all of our programs through the lens of sustainability, either through a market-based solution that can be financially sustainable or building that sustainability through local uh, ownership uh, and building the capacity of local stakeholders to take ownership of their own development needs. So this is where uh, USAID uh, is headed uh, as an agency. Uh, that's why inclusive business uh, is an embodiment of, of uh, all those principles I just described. Uh, and I think it's why um, BCTA is an important platform, because uh, it's great to see that the notions of inclusive business and shared value are becoming more strained, uh, mainstreamed uh, across different uh, development actors. But we also recognize there's a stop, lot still to learn uh, about what works and what doesn't, and, and how do we continue to innovate in the space. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to turn to introducing our panelists uh, today. He'll bring a diverse uh, range of perspectives as practitioners in this inclusive business space. Um, we have a, a diverse range of companies represented, large multinationals like IKEA and, and Muji, leading an emerging market business in the form of TTNet, um, and a leading uh, pioneer in the social enterprise and BOP space uh, in Drishti. Um, so let me introduce, uh, starting uh, at my far right, um, Mr. Greg Priest, who's the uh, Head of Sustainability Policy for IKEA. Uh, we then have uh, Mr. Kei Suzuki, who's the Director and General Manager of the Household Division for Muji. Um, we then have uh, Mr. Satyan Mishra, who's the Co-Founder and CEO of uh, Drishti, and Mr. Abdullah uh, Orkun Kaya, the CEO of TTNet in Turkey. Um, so we'll start with some introductory remarks from each of the panelists around uh, their core business, how inclusive business fits into their strategy, what were some of their business drivers for uh, engaging inclusive business and, and investing in this space. Um, so we'll start with uh, Greg from IKEA. Um, if you could talk a little bit, Greg, about um, 
uh, your role, uh, how inclusive business fits into the vision of IKEA, and particularly some of the, the bold commitments you've made around uh, sustainable cotton sourcing. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, it's really, it's, it's core. Sustainability is core to, to IKEA, the IKEA business. Um, we have uh, our business direction towards FY uh, fiscal year 20 highlights uh, sustainability as one of the three core cornerstones for success of the, of the company. Um, and to do that, <clears throat> we've realized early on that you need to be have a holistic approach and a very inclusive approach. Um, our work in cotton highlights that um, Cotton is the lar second largest uh, commodity that we buy, the second largest uh, resource that we, we, that we use. Um, to have a sustainable supply of cotton is key for us. It's key for our customers to have um, articles to buy. Uh, there's no one in the room who probably doesn't have an article of, that contains cotton in it. You can't go through a day without touching cotton. And for us, it's, it, we, we want to have a supply of cotton for years and years to come. Um, that requires change. Um, the way that cotton is, is uh, harvested and uh, produced now isn't sustainable in the long term. Well, um, we saw that and said, you know, well, things have to change, but how do you do that? Well, we can't do it alone. Um, you need to include the whole chain. And the key was um, if the farmer is successful, if the farmer can um, create a better living for himself or herself and their families to have a better environmental and social impact, then we can have success all the way up to the value chain, and that means including everyone. Great, and, and I can't, you made a fairly bold commitment around not only transforming your own supply chain, but trying to create a whole market around sustainable cotton, is that right? And, yeah. And well, how, how did the company get to making that broader commitment? Exactly, it's, it's about, uh, we can't have a niche product. Uh, it can't be something that we should be, you know, we segment in a small area of the store. It needs to be the whole range. It needs to be everything. So we, you need to transform a market. Um, you do that by not only including um, partners such as WWF to help us roll out the programs to the farmers to help them improve the yield management, reducing chemicals, reducing water usage, but you partner with other companies, and that's where the Better uh, Cotton Initiative came about, was the, the joining of companies together, which with a similar view, to say, you know, we all want this. If we can change the market and drive it forward, then we can. We have the pull from the customers. We have great um, opportunities for the farmers to create a better everyday life for themselves, create a, a better economic situation, and then you have success all the way along. Right. And where is the leadership within your company coming to this initiative? The, the, the core business, uh, mm -hmm. sustainability. How, how are different parts of the business interacting? It, it, it is truly driven by the. Well, I would say as sustainability. I feel like I am part of the core business. Sure. Uh, but uh, but it is really it, it's the, the business, the purchasing organization. Um, they're the ones that drove it. They're the ones that led it. Um, we of course supply a lot of expertise. We hope from the sustainability group and are are mm -hmm. key part of it. But the leadership comes and the actually execution in the company comes from the business. Great, thanks Ben. Okay, if we turn to you and the Muji example. Matt, could you speak a little bit to Muji's motivations for engaging inclusive business, how that fits into the vision and philosophy of the company, and then maybe talk about some of the examples uh, of your partnership with, with Jack on the sourcing side? Yes. Yeah. Hello everybody. Um, actually our motivation is including that of our and the Muji, actually, the French for the uh, Japanese are brand name called Muji Muji Yoko. And as you can see on the slide, I know many of you know about the Japanese character, so let me tell you. The Muji Muji Yoko is Muji, which uh, means no brand. And the Yoko means quality goods. Uh, we were born, our concept was born in 1980, when we see that there's too much commercial, which means at that time, we thought, that the people uh, are misled by the brand name, and also uh, people uh, ask to pay too much. So at Muji, we wanted to provide only the value for the customer without any fruit. So uh, showing our concept that the brand name we named ourselves, uh, Muji, which means no brand quality good. And we have been also always thinking how to uh, have the uh, great uh, harmony amongst human nature and the product. So uh, we always are trying to achieve uh, that sort of things. So uh, the, in other words, Muji aims to contribute society through our main business. So uh, 
having the, our business successful, we want to continue to let us say, contribute to society to our main business activities. Then, uh, for example, uh, sorry, uh, we uh, we started with 40 products, and now we carry over 7,500 7, items. And the uh, top, uh, you see, the uh, stationery. And we were the first, I think, retailer who utilized the recycled paper uh, well over 30 years ago. At that time, not so many people talked about recycling things, but Moji uh, decided, oh, it's good to use recycled things. So then, uh, this is one of the good examples. Uh, we want to make our business to be simply good also for society. So now, one of our biggest ticket items is the Muji house. So also this house also represents that, so our Muji concept. And thinking about the relationship with nature, we also run some campsite in Japan uh, since 1995. So, so and also uh, these are some examples of uh, activities, uh, business activities, which are um, much more aspect of social contributions. Uh, top right hand side one is the project we're working with the uh, Tohoku area, which affected by the March by tsunami earthquake. And that earthquake. So uh, we work the local people to uh, utilize the local uh, uh, skills to promote their uh, product. So um, it is very so natural for us to as I say to improve improve the inclusive business. And all that music, all of us always wants to make our daily business good for the society. And so for example, this project with JICA is initiated by the one of my colleague, uh, Akiko, actually she's here, Akiko. <laughs> so she uh, said, she literally knocked the door of JICA, Japan International Agency. Can I do something good for society with you? And the JICA was very, how does it surprised, uh, maybe from Muji saying, but uh, uh, they uh, welcomed our idea. So uh, JICA uh, proposed uh, 80 potential projects. Uh, many of them are what we they call the uh, OVOP, one place, one product project. So we picked uh, two out of them, and we decided to work with the uh, one in Kyrgyz and another one in Kenya. So and in Kyrgyz, uh, oh, we try to utilize the, the local uh, products, like this felt product. And the, so uh, to create the, some main parts, case or the iPhone case and so on. And also uh, in Kenya, we utilize another one, the soap stone, uh, which is the, oh, sorry, uh, which uh, they have already uh, produced for souvenir, but at Muji, we intention took off their color and make the monarchial color so that they could they use. The last one is the not with the jai, but back and forth. But the natural, uh, natural dye uh, towels. I'm sure I brought the towel. So this towel is made out of the uh, Egyptian very good quality of any cotton. But uh, uh, you might be surprised. But uh, this color is actually uh, dyed with these sticks. At Muji, we produce half of this like furniture. And the, if we try to fully utilize furniture, we okay, uh, we have this kind of sticks. So we use this one to dye the, this color. So also the technique is I really, uh, came from Mr. Morimoto who taught in the Cambodia and the uh, utilizing the traditional time skills. So that we work together to make it work more muscular basis. So yeah, that's what our other other great uh, initiative. Great, thank you, Kay. A very tangible example of inclusive <laughs> business. He has the product in his hand, the fabric and the wood that it comes from. Um, you talked a little bit about the partnership with JICA, and we hear how partnerships are often elements of inclusive business models. What's been the value add of that partnership, and, yeah. and are there any challenges that you've had to overcome as well? Yeah. I think the collaboration uh, with JICA was very... Uh, oh, sorry, could, could you hear my voice? <laughs> Should I repeat everything? <laughs> yeah. Actually, the collaboration with JICA is very good, as I said, very as I said amazing. Because, as I said, at the Muji, we always try to, uh, let's say, find a good thing. So we open back go to India or Laos, wherever. But the collaboration of JICA allows us to work with the Kyrgyzstan. And the, the reason why JICA is working for the uh, poverty. Oh, sorry. 
uh, po to against the poverty. And the, maybe we don't think we're going to work with Kyrgyzstan unless we have a given chance from the JICA who are working very hard to make the local people happier. So um, the also, Kyrgyzstan is not close to Japan. Uh, so, and also JICA people are specialists to make how to organize the local people. So we can provide for the marketing or quality control or rhythm control. And also JICA people can provide how to organize the local people to make their organization or union to can work for, for example, Muji. So, uh, so far we've done by ourselves more, but we found the collaboration with JICA is very what broadened our potential to do the good things to our day-to-day -day business. Great, thank you, Tim. Um, Sajin, if we could turn to you and hear a little bit more about uh, Drishti. Drishti has, of course, been a pioneer in this space, uh, doing inclusive business and serving the BOP before those terms really existed. Um, and it's at the core of your, your mission and, and who you are. So it'd be great to hear more uh, about that core mission, as well as, as you've been a practitioner in this space of models for serving the, the BOP, what you've learned and, and how your models have evolved over time. Thank you, Greg. Uh, the introduction makes me feel a bit old. Uh, but the point is that uh, 14 years in this space is still uh, too little to really understand the threat there. We are trying our best. Uh, as an organization, Trishti has a very bold vision. Right from day one, we uh, do not think just about uh, one village or one country, but the vision has been global. Uh, we are striving to connect about 70,000 villages uh, by 2020. Uh, we are just about, I would say, about 10% uh, uh, in that particular effort so far, uh, having connected about 6,000 villages uh, across north and northeast of India. Uh, I can, okay, so I can also handle it. Uh, uh, the, when we talk about connecting villages, we basically have a vision of a sustainable community. And uh, with sustainable community, we mean a community which is, uh, has the three pillars of sustainability firmly in place, like the livelihood, uh, local people getting jobs locally, uh, provisioning of services, people getting basic services at their doorstep, and some basic infrastructure in place for, for both of these to survive and sustain. That is the vision that the organization has. The way we try and achieve that particular vision. Am I the one who is clicking? Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> it's it's uh, called a 4C approach which we have, which is in the first step, we look at building relationships with communities, uh, trying to structure them in small units, homogeneous units, where the interests are common. Uh, that is the first and the foremost uh, step that we have to take before we really look at doing anything with that particular community. The second is to build the capacity. Uh, building capacity is uh, for the community as a whole and especially for the aim that entrepreneurs and, and uh, young men and women within the village uh, who need to have the basic skills to compete and, and to really strive and, and make their community sustainable. The third step comes up is a rural enterprise. And a rural enterprise, uh, my friend from IKEA would know better, is the one which is where the people can come together to f uh, to form uh, an enterprise which can provide livelihood to the community as well as bring in some some uh, economic stability in the village, which is perhaps very essential for us to even think of doing some business within the community. And the fourth, where Drishti has uh, a business interest, is uh, to build a channel. Uh, we have a last mile in about uh, 6,000 villages and uh, we would like to kind of also make it a very strong first mile out of the village to ensure that we are able to collect products uh, from the local entrepreneurs and, and we are trying to do that but uh, at a very small measure right now. But uh, moving forward by 2020, we, we expect to have a 50-50 share of uh, rural and urban products on the network. This is how the, the supply chain looks like for us, very different from the supply chain that you may have seen. It's a supply chain which is operated by a three-dealer uh, which moves into the villages, about covers about 20 villages uh, on, on one day of the week, uh, supplies to the local storing products from, from the small entrepreneurs within the same villages. 
it's cash to a microfinance uh, organization uh, or a banking uh, outlet uh, it also kind of uh, uh, gives some books to the to the uh, educational entrepreneur that we have so it's this is the lifeline of what uh, we do uh, moving to the next slide don't know how okay uh, it's like maybe i know that i could have taken this up later but uh, just to kind of put broad things in perspective uh, my last last slide is on the fact that the marginalized communities form a huge market when aggregated all of us have we when we look at them we know that it's it's like a puzzle it seems to be big but no one knows how to kind of really crack the puzzle the point is that it is big only when aggregated and and therefore we have to look at them in in a very aggregated manner perhaps they are much bigger than the urban market especially in the developing world the starting point out here is not the product or the service but the need of the community everyone has to start from that particular need really understand the need because it is that need is different from the need which uh, which exists in in the cities unless we start from that need i think we would be pushing and and that is something that we should definitely not do and the value chain of products and services has to be integrated within the community uh, ensuring maximum value to the customers uh, in the community for example like getting milk uh, versus getting yogurt or cheese from the community is far more enabling and, and i'm sure that ikea does it uh, so well and and everyone else has to really look at how you can partner with the community and grow that community uh, to remain kind of maybe important for them and uh, they remaining important for you and finally like uh, the four pillars out here of uh, successful rural uh, distribution strategy as we have learned are sensitivity engagement innovation and patience I and mean, with these four i'm sure that uh, there is uh, there's lot of room for more and more partnerships to be struck between corporate and the communities worldwide marginal or maybe uh, aggregated wherever thank you great thanks thank you satyan um some some great lessons from the the front lines working at the village level of importance of starting with the the customer really listening and understanding the need and not uh, a pull not a push uh, approach uh, I understand also as you're continuing to evolve and expand, you have a new partnership with uh, India's National Skill Development Corporation focused on youth vocational training. What's driven you to expand into that area? Where, where did you see the need, uh, I guess, from, from that perspective? So Chris, actually we have started the other way around. Uh, we started off with a distribution network mm -hmm. and then we realized that uh, we cannot uh, have it uh, socially and economically relevant unless we look at uh, people producing good quality products in the villages. Mm -hmm. And that kind of uh, uh, led us to think that maybe you cannot have good quality products in the villages unless you build the capacity. Mm -hmm. So then that vocational capacity became very, very important for us, uh, perhaps as important as the engagement that we had with the communities. So NSDC is helping us build capacities. We have uh, committed that we'll build capacities of nearly about a million uh, men and women in villages in the next 10 years. That would help us uh, develop better enterprises in the villages. Great. Thanks, Satyan. Uh, Abdullah, last but not least, um, first of all, I think congratulations are in order. This is the first Turkish company to, to have a BCTA commitment. So that's fantastic. Pioneer. We hope many Turkish companies follow. Um, could you, you, your company may not be a household name to many of us outside of Turkey. So could you t tell us a little bit about your core business and then about your, your vision for taking all of Turkey digital? Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Well, uh, Turkey has been a success story during the last you know, 10 years. And I believe, yes, we are the first at this platform. But uh, uh, I, I believe we, we will get more uh, Turkish uh, companies uh, attending this uh, initiative uh, in the coming years. Yes, Turkey has been a success story with its uh, social dynamism and very strong economic uh, growth. And uh, this growth inspires Turkey for you know, higher ambitious goals, like being uh, among the world's top 10 economies in 10 years. And ICT and digitalization uh, are the key drivers uh, behind uh, this uh, development. And TTNet, the company that I uh, run, uh, is Turkey's largest uh, broadband operator with uh, over uh, 6 million subscribers. And thus a natural uh, leader in transformation to a digital uh, information society. 
So we consider our own call to action for going digital, an important drive uh, for development. I did in my first drive, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Technology. Our call for uh, going digital includes expanding Turkey's digital ecosystem with innovative services, redefining the value for money perception of internet, and also promoting technology to enhance the life of local communities. We aim uh, at increasing Turkey's online, online uh, population and shifting 10 million non-online uh, users into users. Though there is still a digital gap among uh, different regions of uh, Turkey, and uh, some areas enjoy high broadband penetration, while some others are lagging behind. And actually, we see a potential for digitally enriched world for these regions with uh, economic and social disadvantages. And we are determined to ensure the sustainability of this potential by creating a strategy that will grow our business and ecosystem as well. Hence, we came up with our Internet for All initiative. Basic components of Internet for All are low-cost reach to digital services, plus internet literacy tra training, and Vitamin, which is a unique online educational platform which covers full school curriculum. And it's developed by uh, our sister company called Sebit. Vitamin provides an engaging and dynamic learning experience and excites the attention of the youth with animations, interactive simulations, uh, experiments, online tests, on top of that, some uh, gaming as well. As you all want the best for our children, and we take this as a priority, we believe uh, households, families, will have a great reason to bring internet uh, to their homes. Access and content then supported by a face-to-face -face basic internet literacy training, uh, builds our internet for all program. And we have developed this training program with uh, UNDP Turkey, also Minister of Communication and Minister of uh, Development. We aim at reaching uh, over you know, 12,000 uh, people with this uh, training. And also in terms of subscribers, we believe the potential is you know, up to uh, 100,000 uh, in the first year. All together, uh, Internet for All initiative forms an inclusive initiative and an engaging call to action to younger individuals and their families for going digital. We will continue to come up with uh, such in initiatives because still uh, broadband penetration in Turkey is lower than its peers in Europe. And there is good potential for us in terms of business and also for development of the country. Thank you. Great, thank you, Abdul. Uh, they're a great example of an inclusive business initiative that has the, the potential to have really transformative impact for, for Turkey and enabling its continued growth, but also clear interest in building the long-term market for your, your business. Um, and in that context, I, as a CEO, I wonder how you, you think about some of those uh, tensions that you face in terms of, yes, you have a long-term interest in building these markets, they're your future customers, but I'm sure you face short-term <coughs> profitability uh, pressure. So how does that inform your decision to invest in this sort of initiative? How does it inform your thinking about pricing for this sort of market? Could you comment on that? Yeah. Actually, you know, these uh, initiatives are regional ones. So they are not always available to the mass. And we try to minimize the costs around it. For instance, we don't come up with mass communication. Uh, there are no commercials on uh, TVs, etc. And also, uh, when we are coming up with feasibility analysis, we don't just look at the you know, revenue that we will get in the first year. We do uh, look at the you know, uh, subscriber lifetime value. And we also consider the 
upsell potential. We believe, you know, uh, these households will go and ask for more, more, more uh, online. So, you know, uh, that's the uh, financial rationale behind it. Great, great. Thanks. Uh, let me just pose a, a couple of questions that are sort of cross-cutting to, to, to the panelists and then leave ample time for, for questions from the audience. Um, so a perennial question around or issue around inclusive business is, is getting to scale. And we have lots of examples of, of pilots or, or specific country level interventions, but fewer examples of really uh, taking these models to scale. And we, we all have an interest in that from both the business perspective and the development perspective. Um, can you talk about how your companies are, are thinking about uh, scale? What is a vision of having scaled up inclusive business in, in your company context? Um, what are the key challenges you think that need to be overcome or learnings we need to have to be able to go from, from pilot to scale in your contexts? We can start anywhere. Greg, do you want to? Sure, sure. Um, I, I think there was, for us, there's been a, there's been a couple of key moments. Um, one is to, um, is to have this holistic approach, and it starts, we, we got rid of the, the thought of doing less bad. We want to, you know, we started with the, the vision, you know, in everything we do from a sustainability point of view, we want to have a positive effect. And then that changes the whole concept of, you know, what you're looking at. And I think uh, Satyan hit it very well in, in the, the four pillars when you're dealing with something very local, is also having the knowledge that, you know, from a global perspective, we have an initiative, we have a, have a goal, but we also need expertise at a very, very local level um, that we may not have, even our global partners might not have. You might, you're going to have to go very local to partnerships and inclusiveness that way to, to have success. So I think the scalability of it is that we have, we can have the poll in a sense, and then mm -hmm. have the knowledge that we also need very local partnerships, expertise, um, organizations to help us um, that we're not doing, uh, having a negative impact uh, with this hopefully very positive initiative. Great, so global pool, but a network of local oh, relationships right. and, and business models, great. Okay, would you like to? Yeah. Um, yes, I think the, for example, our project with JICA, and compared to the, our other, I'd say, the businesses sizes, now is not so big, but I think it is much potential. Because the, uh, for example, in the last three years, we see much improvement of the producers who never produced uh, products for the JICA Japan or whatever. And also, now, many of our customers are very keen to have the, some product which has a uh, good story behind that. So by communicating uh, better to the customer, and also by looking at improving uh, quality, and also by we understanding the market needs. So I believe that the, uh, even that this kind of inclusive business can have the uh, quite good size of the scale. And also, I think key thing is to just steadily grow, rather than rapidly grow up and falling here zero. That's a bad thing. So we want to make the steadily and the uh, growing. Great. Yeah. Take the time to learn and, and scale right mm -hmm. and yeah. not overextend. Satya? <coughs> For us, um, scale has always been uh, a very debatable topic. When we had started, we had about uh, three to six kiosks. And uh, at that point of time, 60 looked to be um, a scale, and uh, now that we have, we are working about six thousand with nearly about uh, twelve thousand entrepreneurs on the network. Still, we are we are a minuscule. Uh, our, our entire effort can be considered to be minuscule as against the the challenge that we have in a country like India. Uh, <clears throat> but the point is that for us, scale uh, is, is secondary. It is more important how deep can we go, how uh, important our relationship is with each community. And uh, thanks to investors like Acumen, I uh, can maybe raise hand. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have come this far. But I think it is not just for Drishti to take this model uh, to all the communities across the globe. It is for other organizations to, um, to learn together, adapt, see, and, and then take it forward. Because it's, it's not a single organization effort which is really going to make this world a better place. In our case, definitely, you know, fixed uh, infrastructure uh, brings a barrier, but uh, we are very lucky in Turkey on that because our parent company uh, has a very wide uh, fixed uh, broadband uh, network. Then uh, comes the uh, content to trigger 
the need for broadband. Uh, we did have some problems there because uh, Turkish content was rare. And we as TTNet invested in uh, content side. So we came up with uh, education content in Turkish, gaming in Turkish. So we are coming up with uh, content in local language. So it will actually uh, reach uh, to a scale. Uh, in our business, if you have the infrastructure, if you have the content, then the distribution is easier because everything is online and you don't need to deal with you know, lots of problems around uh, logistics. Great, thanks. Um, so we have both some national companies here based in emerging markets. These are your home customers and some international uh, companies represented where moving into these markets is, is maybe newer, not these, uh, these days, but a newer development as opposed to your core markets. Uh, I'm wondering if you, the notion of inclusive business is different in the context of an Indian and a Turkish company, or for these companies or other companies here, um, global companies, what, what can they learn from your business models and your work um, with these customers from, from your, your very founding? What advice would you have for global companies um, that are newer to, to thinking about um, engaging BOP customers or suppliers in their, in their core business? Maybe start with you, Satya. In the last um, couple of years, we have actually come across, we have learned a lot from, from Japanese companies. <laughs> and uh, it's just the way they interact um, as against um, some of the Western companies. The approach is very different. The approach is more long-term. Patience is, is, uh, is something which is uh, the hallmark of uh, such organizations. I have been blessed to kind of uh, really work with uh, a few organizations like Rico, especially, uh, wherein... And they are uh, looking at the value uh, that uh, the, the community wants. So much so that uh, a company which is into the business of printing first started by setting up uh, shops, uh, women shops, which, uh, are run, which are run by women and they uh, have products only for women. And, and it was such a diversity that uh, we, we could not have imagined that they will have the patience to first kind of uh, look at the value that they can create for the community and then look at <clears throat> what value can they get out of that particular community. So I think it is it is uh, the four pillars that I mentioned. I think uh, patience is the key. And, and also like the sensitivity that you have for the community. How much can you, can, can you really relate with that customer? The difference between... Um, uh, investing in, in the urban and the rural space or maybe in the, in the space which is the, called the BOP is the fact that you, uh, you don't have the same customer. You, you, are not, you cannot put yourself in the shoes of the customer yourself. So you have to kind of get closer to the customer, understand the customer, and then kind of really look at doing business. Great, thank you. Abdul, any comments? I think uh, for local companies or national ones, uh, especially markets like Turkey, uh, governments are uh, very supportive. So in any project uh, that you can name as, you know, inclusive business, you can feel the support of, you know, different ministries. So in our projects, we do have a Minister of Communication next to us, Minister of Development next to us. Uh, and uh, I think that's a bit different than, you know, uh, more uh, developed uh, countries. And also in Turkish context, uh, we are again uh, lucky uh, by having UNDP's own global center on uh, private sector in development. So they are also, you know, guiding uh, these national companies on uh, such uh, initiatives as well. Great. 